The rest of you, if you would take your Bibles, please, and turn to uh, Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22 this morning. And in a, just a moment, we're going to begin reading in verse 54. But before we do that, I want to ask you a question. <clears throat> what would you do if you had a pastor that felt that it was okay to, uh, to, uh, to curse at a teenage girl who asked him a question that he didn't want to answer? I mean, stop and think about that for a second. What would you do with a guy like that if it was your daughter and he cursed at? Well, I'll tell you, if it was me, I, I, I'd probably want to confront him, or at the very least, I'd be finished with him and walk away. Well, friend, there was a pastor who did just that. Uh, his name was Simon Peter. Only Jesus was not finished with him. God wasn't finished. And that's the story we see in Luke chapter 22, uh, beginning at verse 54, and that's where we're going to be this morning. The setting is right after Jesus Christ had been betrayed uh, in the garden and uh, uh, by Judas, and so we're going to pick up in verse 40 or 54 and read through verse 62. Please follow along with us in your Bible, Luke 22. And so they arrested him. That is, the soldiers took him and led Jesus away to the high priest's home, and Peter followed at a distance. The guards lit a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat around it, and Peter joined them there. A servant girl noticed him in the firelight and began staring at him. And finally, she said, this man was one of Jesus' followers. But Peter denied it, saying, woman, I don't even know him. And after a while, someone else looked at him and said, you must be one of them. No, sir, I'm not, he replied angrily. About an hour later, somebody else confidently insisted, this man's got to be one of them, for he is a Galilean too. But Peter said, man, I don't know what you're talking about. And immediately, while he was still speaking, <clears throat> the rooster crowed. And at that moment, the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And suddenly the Lord's words flashed through Peter's mind. Before the rooster crows tomorrow morning, you will deny three times that you even know me. And Peter left the courtyard weeping bitterly. You ever heard uh, the crowing of a rooster? Anybody ever been out on a farm or something? There it is. <laughs> Play that again, Peter. <clears throat> All right. <laughs> that guy's working hard, isn't he? Roosters are actually God's alarm clocks with feathers on them. <laughs> we can all kind of, uh, that idyllic uh, 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 fantasy in our head or imagine growing up on a farm or laying there in a bed and just waking up to the call of a, of a rooster in the morning. I mean, that bird literally thinks that it's crowing is causing the sun to come up. Uh, and so he proudly struts around, cock a doo 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 <laughs> and, uh, and is just crowing and with his chest puffed up. Do you think... Uh, that this was in the Bible by accident? Do you think that the Holy Spirit recorded this for us by accident? Uh, or that the Lord mentioned the crowing of a rooster in conjunction with Peter's sin accidentally? I don't. I don't. Matter of fact, I think that God put this in here to teach us a powerful and wonderful lesson. And so what we're going to call it this morning is the revelation of the rooster. Because not only was it a revelry, it was the dawning uh, of a brand new day. And if anybody needed to turn the page, uh, it was the Apostle Peter. Peter had had one of the darkest nights uh, of his entire life. I mean, it was a night of despair and doubt, a night of disobedience and, and warfare. He had failed the Lord whom he, who, who he so dearly loved. But then the rooster crows and ushers in the dawning of a brand new day. And I want to apply this this morning to your heart and to my heart to, because I want to remind you, if ever there was a person who was sure that he would remain standing for the Lord Jesus Christ, it was Peter. Peter was certain that he would never fall and he would not fail. But here he is with the other disciples sharing a Passover meal uh, and, and, and what would turn out to be uh, the last supper that they would share together on earth before Jesus' crucifixion. And Jesus is telling them that one of the disciples there are going to betray him. And they begin to ask uh, uh, Jesus, which one 
would it be? Who would do such a terrible thing? And Jesus tells them he must die. And so they're all stirred up and they're wondering, who would betray Jesus? Who would betray him? And Peter says, it's not, I, I wouldn't do anything like that. It could never be me. And in verse 31, beginning in verse 31, here's what Jesus says to Simon. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat, but I have pleaded for you in prayer. Simon, that your faith should not fail. So when you have repented and turned to me again, strengthen your brothers. And then look in verse 33. Uh, Peter said, Lord, I'm ready to go to prison with you and even to die with you or for you. But Jesus said, Peter, let me tell you something. Before the rooster crows, you will deny that you even knew me three times. Friend, I want to tell you something. Peter loved the Lord God with all his heart. And he was sincere when he said what he said. Uh, I mean, he really thought that he understood his heart. Do you know what the Bible said in Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse 9? The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked for who can know it. And that's not only Peter's heart. That's every one of our hearts in here as well. I think many of us would look at our lives and say, you know what? We may put on a, 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 a facade out here, and you see what I let you see, but I really know myself. <laughs> I know what I would do, and I know what I wouldn't do. I got a pretty good grip on who I am. I know my heart, and I know that I would never deny the Lord Jesus Christ. But I want you to know, ladies and gentlemen, that you don't know your own heart. You really don't. There's not a one of us who knows our own heart, for the heart is deceitful. The heart is a schemer. The heart is a conniver and a plotter and a manipulator. Jeremiah said, who can know the heart? Nobody can know their own heart. You see, many of us today do not think that we would ever fail the Lord. Peter didn't think he was going to fail. And I'll tell you why Peter did not think he was going to fail, especially in this area of standing up for his faith. Peter didn't think he would fail because if Peter had anything, it was c -c -c courage. It was courage. Peter had courage. Peter, that was Peter's strong point. Who was it that stepped out of the boat when everybody else was holding on for dear life and walked on the water? It was Peter. Who was it that took out his sword when the mob bum-rushed Jesus Christ and, and was willing to fight all of them off if he had to single-handedly? It was Simon Peter. But friend, I want you to see something. Peter did not fail at the point of his weakness. He failed at the point of his strength. You see, most people do not understand that many times uh, it's not in our weakness that we stumble and fail, but it's at the point of our strength. And it's been true of many of the Bible characters if you study the history of the Bible. Take Abraham, for example. What was Abraham's strength? Uh, it was his faith. As a matter of fact, he's listed in Hebrews chapter 11 in the hall of faith uh, as the father of the faithful. And yet, where did Abraham fail? He failed the Lord uh, in a, in, at the point of his faith. Remember when he was down in Egypt? Rather than trusting the Lord, uh, he, he, he told a lie to get himself out of a situation. The story is recorded in Genesis chapter 20, verse 1 through 11. It says that while living as a foreigner, Abraham introduced his wife Sarah by saying, She is my sister. So King Abimelech sent for Sarah and had her brought to the palace. But that night God came to Abimelech in a dream and told him, you're a dead man, for the woman you have taken is already married. But Abimelech had not slept with her yet, and so he said, <coughs> Lord, will you destroy an innocent nation? Didn't Abraham tell me? She is my sister, and, her, and she herself said, he's my brother. I acted in complete innocence, and my hands are clean. In a dream, God responded, yes, I know that you're innocent. And that's why I kept you from sinning against me and why I did not let you touch her. Now return the woman to her husband and he will pray for you for he is a prophet and then you will live. But if you don't return her to him, you can be sure that you and all your people will die. Abimelech got up early the next morning and quickly called all of his servants together. And when he told them what had happened, the men were terrified. Uh, then Abimelech called for Abraham. What have you done to us? He demanded. What crime have I committed that deserves such treatment like this, making me and my kingdom guilty of this great sin? 
No one should ever do what you have done. Whatever possessed you to do such a thing? Verse 11, Abraham replied, I thought, since this is a godless place, that they will want my wife and kill me to try to get her. So Abraham was afraid, and rather than trusting in God, for God to get him through this problem, he lied to get himself out of a situation. And so he failed in his area of faith. What was David's greatest strength? In Samuel chapter 13 and verse 14, it was his integrity. The Lord uh, or, or told, uh, had sought a man after his own heart, Samuel tells Saul, and he tells Saul that David's it. You're not. David's it. And so David was a man after God's own heart heart. David was a man after God's own heart. And yet, where did David fail? He failed at the point of his integrity. He committed adultery and failed to keep uh, the vows of marriage which he'd made before the Lord. You know, it's a strange thing that Peter would fall at the point of his greatest strength. It's a strange thing that human beings often fall at the point of our greatest strength. But that's exactly what happened here. And it ought to be a warning to every one of us here today who are saying, I would never fail the Lord. I'm never going to step away from God. I will never deny the Lord Jesus Christ. I may not be everything that I need to to be right now but I can tell you this you be sure of this I am strong in that area but the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 10 2 therefore let anyone who thinks he stands take heed lest he falls and friend what happened to Simon Peter ought to be a warning to every one of us here today because I want you to know you do not love the Lord more than Simon Peter loved God you do not love the Lord more then Peter loved God, trust me. And you are not stronger than Simon Peter was. And if you depend upon the flesh as Simon Peter depended upon his flesh, I'm telling you, you are going to fail like Simon Peter failed. It is an arrogant and self-sufficient person that tempts the devil to tempt them. When the devil heard old Simon say, Hey, not me, Lord. I go to prison with you if I have to. I'll even die with you if we need to. So let's get it on. Come on. I'm with you, God. When he heard Peter stand up and say that, then he said, hey, there's a point where I can get into now. And Jesus told Peter, the devil wants to sift you like we. Friend, I'm telling you, the devil is always looking for a place to get into your life. And he's very very deceptive at doing it. Here's the way it gets us to sin. Before he sinned, he said, go ahead. You can get away with it. Go ahead and do it. It'll feel good. It'll taste good. It looks good. It, it, go ahead. You can get away with it. And then after we sin, he says, look what you've done. You're never going to get away with this. Come on now. He's so devious. First he comes as the tempter. And then after we get into the sin that he tempts us to commit. Then he comes as the accuser. On the one hand, he's tempting us to sin. And after we do it, he's accusing us of that sin, uh, telling us we can get away with it until we do it, and then telling us you'll never get away with it. And Peter, in his arrogance, and with the help of the devil, because the devil desired to sift him as we, Peter emphatically denied that he knew the Lord, uh, and he did it repeatedly. And then at that exact moment, as the words were still rolling off of his tongue, and Peter was denying the Lord, the rooster crowed. The rooster crowed. I want you to know that it was a miracle. It was a miracle when that bird cackled. It was a miracle that the rooster crowed. I'm telling you, can you imagine? You say, how in the world is a rooster crowing a miracle? Well, think of it with me for a second. Can you imagine all the roosters in Jerusalem keeping silent until that very moment when that sucker crows? Come on now. That was an absolute miracle. As the words are still in Simon's mouth, just as he completes his words, uh, that rooster crows. Look in verse 60. Peter told his accuser, who said, you must be one of them. I don't know what you're talking about. And immediately, while he was still speaking, the Bible said that rooster crowed. The King James says, while he yet spake. It was a miracle 
with a message. It was a revelation from a rooster. God was telling Peter, hey, you failed, but look here. Here's the rooster. He's crowing. He's ushering in the dawning of a brand new day. Are you listening to me? Somebody say amen. Amen. See, it had been a long, dark night of failure, disappointment, disobedience, and disillusionment. And this rooster told Peter three things, though, that I believe God is telling us uh, today three things that are true when you fail. And I hope that every time you hear a rooster crow from now on for the rest of your life, that you'll remember these three things. The first thing the rooster tells us is this. Number one, <clears throat> that Christ is the Christ of sovereignty and power. Write that down in your outline. Now, what does the word sovereign mean? What does the word sovereign mean? A sovereign is a ruler. A sovereign is somebody with authority and power. A sovereign is one who rules. Not like this dog and pony show that they have over in Great Britain today where they have a, 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 a queen who's really nothing more than a figurehead and has no power to rule, a sovereign is somebody who really rules. And what the crowing of the, uh, crowing of the rooster showed was that Jesus is sovereign. I'm telling you, Jesus Christ is Lord. Somebody say amen. Jesus Christ is Lord. You say, well, how in the world does the rooster cackling show that Jesus Christ was Lord? Because he certainly didn't look like a sovereign at this point. Well, I agree. I agree. And in part, that was part of what got Peter into trouble, you see. Peter thought that Jesus was going to be an earthly king and that he was going to be the one to deliver Israel from their, her oppressors. And, and so Peter put everything he had uh, into that basket. And it's a large part of why Peter was following Jesus because he was going to ensure and help that Jesus, uh, help Jesus to become that earthly king. And now he sees Jesus, his earthly king, being betrayed by one of his own and arrested and then led off by some soldiers and he's falsely accused uh, and now he's on trial and he's being pushed around and punched and spit upon and, 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 and everything seems to be falling apart in front of Peter's eyes and Peter's hope is crumbling and Peter's confused. Uh, let me tell you something. In his confusion, it begins to cause doubt and his doubts lead to his fear and his fear leads to his denial. Oh, you might want to remember that. Because he had lost sight of the sovereignty of the Lord Jesus Christ. But then at this very precise moment, the rooster crows exactly as Jesus said it would. I mean, it was perfect timing. And Peter knew at that very moment that God is still in control. Because it was exactly as God had said it would be. And Peter's standing there thinking, why did I ever doubt him? When am I ever going to realize and learn to believe that God has not lost control of anything. Somebody say man. God hasn't lost control of a single thing. Friend Jesus said in John 10 18. That nobody can take my life from me. I sacrifice it voluntarily. You see nothing happened. Outside the will of God. For he is sovereign. Remember when God created man. And placed him in the garden. God gave man dominion. <laughs> in Genesis chapter 1. Could somebody get me a drink or we're going to struggle up here desperately. Mm. Now I got five people getting me a drink. You give me five bottles of water, we're preaching all day. Glory to God. Amen. <clears throat> in Genesis 1, 26, the Bible said that God gave to man, a man dominion in the garden. He said, let us make man in our image, in the image of God. God said, let us make man in our image. Uh, that's in his image. That's in God's image. Well, God is sovereign. God is king. And so God said, let us make man in our image, in the image of the king and king. Uh, king and uh, You threw me off, brother. Thank you. Lord. Give that servant a big hand. Glory to God. Man. Let's make man, uh, let us make man in our uh, image. I want you to know, in the Garden of Eden, 
was King Adam and Queen Eve. They had dominion over the garden. And God said, let them be masters of all life upon the earth and in the skies and in the seas. But you can read about it in the 8th Psalm that man lost dominion and the Lord Jesus was exercising there the dominion that Adam should have had. You see, Adam had dominion over the beasts of the field. In Luke 4, 1, 2, after his baptism, Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. The Bible said he was tempted there for 40 days. Uh, and he ate nothing and became very hungry. And I want you to know, it wasn't like when he was in the wilderness going out and camping in your own backyard. There were wild beasts uh, in the wilderness. And so Jesus wasn't the only one out there who was hungry, but they didn't bother him. Why? Because he had dominion over the beast of the field. When he got ready to, uh, for his triumphal entry into Jerusalem in Mark 11:2, it's recorded that he told his disciples to go into the village and you will see a young donkey tied that no one has ever ridden. I want you to tie it and bring it there to me. Now, at one point in my life, we had horses. We raised horses. I broke a couple horses in my life. <laughs> I didn't finish them out too well, but they were at least green broke. But let me tell you something. How many of you have ever got on the back of a donkey that's never been ridden? You do it, and it'll be the only donkey you ever get on. Amen? Okay? It, I'm telling you, but Jesus got on an unbroken donkey and rode that donkey into Jerusalem. How in the world did he ever do that? He did it because he had dominion over the beast of the field. He had dominion over the fish of the sea. In John 21, verse 3 through 6, uh, 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 Todd was talking about it this morning. Peter and some of the disciples were out fishing, and they'd caught nothing all night. And Jesus calls out to them and tells them to throw their nets over the other side. Throw them over the right-hand side of the boat, and you'll get some fish. And so they do, and the Bible says they catch so many fish that they couldn't haul all their nets in. Their nets were so full. Hey, how'd they do that? Well, he had dominion over the fish of the sea. In Matthew chapter 17, verse 24 through 27, there's an account of Jesus and taxes. This is a good one. You might want to pay attention to this one. <laughs> the collectors of the temple tax came to Peter and asked him, doesn't your teacher pay the temple tax? Well, yes, he does, Peter replied. And then he went into the house. But before he had the chance to speak, uh, Jesus asked him, what do you think, Peter? Do kings tax their own people or do they tax the people they have conquered? And Jesus replied in verse 26, they tax the people they have conquered. Boy, I'll tell you what, that's, a, that's, that's an area right there for a whole sermon series right there. Amen? Okay. Uh, well then, Jesus said, uh, uh, the citizens are free. However, we don't want to offend them, so go down to the lake, throw in a line, open the mouth of the first fish you catch, and you'll find a large silver coin Take that coin and go pay the temple tax for both of us. Now, I want you to think about that for just a second. We read that, and it's amazing, but you stop and think about that. Jesus Christ guided this fish like a guided missile to a coin that had perhaps fallen out of a fisherman's pocket in the water. And then he put that fish with a coin in its mouth on the one hook in all the Sea of Galilee that the Lord wanted it to go to. How in the world was he able to do that? I'll tell you how. He had dominion over the fish of the sea. He also had dominion over the birds of the air. For, Je for, for Jesus was the one who saw to it that not another rooster crowed into, in Jerusalem until this rooster crowed at that exact moment. Friend, what does that tell you? I don't know, but I'll tell you what it tells me. In the midst of your fears, in the midst of your frustration, in the midst of your failure, you remember what that rooster told Peter that morning because it's the same message that he's telling you and I today. Jesus Christ is still in control. Are you hearing me? Jesus is in control. Amen? He's in control. And when you forget that, you're going to get yourself in trouble the same way that Peter got himself in trouble. Because you're going to begin to put your eyes on your circumstances and take your eyes off the promises of God. And when you put your eyes on your circumstances, you're going to think that the world is spinning out of control. 
that God has lost control that, and everything is falling apart and unraveling. But I came to tell you today that God is still on the throne. God is still on his throne. Somebody give him praise. God is still on his throne. Uh, and he's able to wrap Romans 8, 28 around every problem that you have. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and have been called according to his purpose. Friend, we serve a mighty and powerful God, and I want you to remind yourself of that this morning. But there's another thing this rooster is telling us today. Not only is Jesus Christ the Christ of sovereignty and power, he is also the Christ, ladies and gentlemen, of sympathy and compassion. Look in verse 60 and 61 again. Peter said, I don't know what you're talking about. And immediately while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. And at that moment, the Lord turned and looked at Peter. You ever had somebody turn and flash you a look? They don't have to say nothing. They just throw you a look. What kind of look was it that Jesus gave to Peter? What, kind of, what, 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 what look was that? I mean, was it, was, was it a look of condemnation? Was it a look of irritation? No. It was a look of injured love. In fact, it was a look that had so much love and so much compassion in it that the Bible said it literally broke the heart of Simon Peter. And as a result, he runs out of the courtyard weeping, friend. When Jesus gave that look to Peter, at the same time the rooster was crowing, it was as if Jesus was saying, Simon, I knew that this was going to happen to you. But remember, Simon, no matter what, I have not stopped loving you. Here was the Lord Jesus on the way to the cross, on the way to his execution taking time out to give a reassuring look to a backslidden disciple. Why? Because he loved him with all his heart and he wanted to reassure him. He was still concerned about Peter. I'm going to tell you something that's profound. And if you haven't heard anything I'm telling you today, I hope you'll listen to this, especially if you've ever failed the Lord Jesus Christ or disappointed him or disobeyed him. I want to tell you, God does not change us in order that to love us God loves us and that's what changes us let me say that again God does not change us uh, in order so he can love us he loves us and that's what changes us so many of us are trying to make ourselves acceptable to God so that he will love us and that's who Peter was Peter was surprised uh, by his behavior he never knew that he would, he did not believe that he would do that, but Jesus knew he would do it because Jesus knew that Peter was trusting in the flesh and Jesus, my friend, did not come to improve our flesh. He came to replace our flesh and replace that old self. Peter was depending upon Peter and Jesus knew it, but Jesus still loved him and that's why he told him, you're going to deny me, but I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you because he wanted him to know it was coming, but that he still cared for Peter. In essence, he was telling Peter, I love you. Friend, your sin cannot and your failures have not stopped God from loving you. Amen. And the crowing of the rooster tells us simply that he's a God of compassion and a God of love who looks at us with a heart of tenderness and says, your failures, whatever they may be, your failures are not final. You can be forgiven. And you can be restored. Uh, so Jesus tells Simon, when you repented and turned to me again, strengthen your brothers. Because he knew that Peter uh, was still a part of God's plan. God was still working in his life. And he still loved Peter in spite of Peter's failure. There's one more thing the crowing of the rooster tells us. Number three, it tells us that Jesus Christ is the Christ of security and protection. Verse 60 again, Peter said, I don't know what you're talking about. And immediately while still speaking, the rooster crowed. And at that very moment, the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And suddenly the Lord's words flashed through Peter's mind. Well, what words were those? What words were those? Well, remember what Jesus had said back in verse 31 and 32. He said, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat. But I have pleaded in prayer for you, Simon, that your faith should not fail. So when you have repented and turned to me again, strengthen your brothers. 
He told him, Simon, you're going to be sifted. Simon, you're going to have trouble. Simon, you're going to have trials. Simon, you're going to go through tribulation. Simon, you're going to fail. But I want you to know, in the midst of that, when you come out of that, know that I am praying for you. Hey, listen to me. There were two men who were interested in Simon's sin that day, and there are two men who are interested in yours. One is Satan, and the other is the Savior. Amen? One is the devil, and the other is Jesus. Satan is interested in Simon's sin because Satan was there to sift Simon. And by the way, did you catch that Jesus used the word Simon? Okay, that's his old name. That's his old name because it speaks of his old nature. He said, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat. Uh, do you know what it is to sift something? I don't know if we do that too much today. But what it is that you, you, take, a, you take a grain or, or whatever, a, a, a small rice or whatever, and you, you take a wire mesh and you pull that grain, pour that grain over the wire mesh and you shake it. And the grain is able to fall through. And what's left are the impurities or the, the straw or what we call the impurity. That's what the devil wanted to do with Simon. Okay? He wanted to sift Peter so that he could find the impurities and the filth and the trash in Peter's life. Because the devil, who is the accuser, wanted to use those things to condemn him and accuse Simon Peter. Friend, I'm telling you, the devil wants to find your sin so that he can condemn you of what you've been doing wrong. Do you know what he's doing right now? I'm telling you, the church is never empty. The devil is moving to and fro, screening the saints, trying to find some fault or some flaw in you that he might accuse you. But Jesus is interested in your sin as well. Only Jesus is interested in your sin for a different reason. He's interested in your sin not that he can accuse you, but that he might convict you so that he can cleanse you, that he might secure you, that he might keep you. Now, there's something really cool, and so I want you to get ready for a blessing. Look in verse 31. Jesus said, Simon, Simon, Satan. You might want to underline that. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat. But notice verse 32. But I have pleaded in prayer for you. Simon, Simon, Satan is coming, but I am standing here doing battle for you. Amen? Tell me if that's not a blessing in your life. Friend, it is a perfect illustration of 1 John 4, 4 that says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in this world. The devil desires you, but Jesus Christ is praying for you. You see, the protection of the saints uh, is wrapped up in the prayers of the Savior. And yes, Satan has power. But God has more power, and Satan may desire us, but Jesus Christ is interceding for us. He's going to the Father, hallelujah, and he's doing battle for us. Some people don't believe in eternal security. You heard it today on one of the videos. Uh, you quote to them John 10, 27 and 28, where Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life. And they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. And someone will argue, well, you're right, preacher. No man can snatch them out. But the devil can take you out. The devil can sure snatch you out. Were you sure about that? I want you to think about that with me for a second. Because the verse literally says, no one can snatch them out of my hand. But let's just say the devil could. Let's say the suppose the devil could snatch you out of the Lord's hand. I mean, it doesn't make sense, does it? Because if he could, don't you think he would? Come on now. But let's just say that he can, but he hasn't taken you out yet. Does that mean the devil's being good to you? I mean, think about the doctrine of that, okay? That some of you might get to heaven by the goodness of the devil. Listen and hear me clearly. The only reason that he hasn't snatched you out is because he can't snatch you out. Jesus told Simon, Simon, the devil wants you, but I am praying for you. And that's what the crowing of the rooster reminded Peter that day. And I pray it reminds you of the very same thing. That in spite of your failure, Jesus Christ is doing battle for you. He's the God of security. He loves you. And because he loves you, you. He's a Savior who's praying for you. You say, well, now, wait a minute, preacher. Wait a minute, preacher. <clears throat> it says that he prayed for Peter, but it doesn't say he prayed for me. Well, I'm glad you brought that up. 
Go over to John chapter 17 and verse 9. And let me show you something that's going to bless your heart. You ever hear some lady say, well, bless your heart. I'm fixing to bless your heart. Amen. John 17, 9 right here. Bless your heart. Folks, <clears throat> Jesus said, I pray for them. I'm, Jesus is praying here. And inter his intercessory, high priestly prayer. And he says, I pray for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. Friend, contrary to popular opinion, Jesus is not up in heaven praying for the lost. He's praying for the saved. He said, I'm not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they belong to you. They're yours. And what is Jesus praying when he's praying for the saved? Well, look in verse 15 of John 17. I'm not asking you to take them out of the world. I'm asking you to keep them safe, protect them from the evil one. Jesus is praying for our safety. Jesus is praying for our protection. Jesus is praying for our security. Not that we will be free of trouble or disappointment or temptation or trials. I'm telling you, all of those things are a part of God's plan to grow us and to mature us as human beings and Christians. You say, well, preacher, that was for folks way back then. That was for folks in Bible time. <laughs> like this is not. <laughs> that was for folks in Bible time, preacher. Okay? He was praying for Peter, James, and John and the rest of all that bunch. Okay. Well, then skip down to verse 20 of John 17. Jesus said, I'm praying not only for these disciples, but for all who will ever believe in me through their message. You see, folks, Jesus Christ looked down through the corridor of time, and he sees Brian Rumor, and he says, there's old Brian Rumor, and Father, Satan wants to sift Brian. In fact, he wants to sift all those people down there, but I'm praying for Brian, and I'm praying for the church, and I want to ask you, my friend, when Jesus Christ is praying, Praying. Has Jesus ever prayed a prayer that has went unanswered? Has he ever prayed a prayer that went unanswered? Never. In John chapter 11 and verse 41 and 42, when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, look here. It said when they rolled the stone aside, Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, thank you for hearing me, for you always hear me. Somebody say amen. You always hear me. But he said, I said it out loud for the sake of these people standing here so that they would believe uh, that you sent me. Now think about it. If Jesus ever prayed a prayer that it went unanswered, then that would have meant that he was praying outside the will of God. But 1 John 5, 14 said, this is the confidence that we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to God's will, he will hear us. So I want to ask you again, has God ever failed to answer the prayer of Jesus? Has Jesus ever gotten outside the will of God? No. Because if he had, if Jesus had prayed a prayer that wasn't answered, it would have meant that Jesus did not have faith, and therefore he wasn't praying in the will of God, and therefore he would have been a sinner. For Romans 14 verse 23 said, whatever is not of faith is sin. So that would have meant that Jesus was a sinner. But 1 Peter 2 22 said, Jesus committed no sin, neither was there deceit found in his mouth. Friend, you will never convince me. That Jesus Christ has ever prayed a prayer that was not answered. And what did he pray? <coughs> he prayed for his own. That we would be kept. It was the same thing he was praying for Peter. And it was a prayer that his father heard. And it's a prayer that his father has answered. And that's why he told Peter in Luke chapter 22 and verse 32. When you repent. Hey, not if. When you repent. And you get strengthened. Your faith is strengthened. Your faith is restored. Go and strengthen your brothers. And friend, do you know what he's telling you and me right now? I'll tell you. He, here's what he's doing for you and me right now. Hebrews 7.25. Therefore, he is able once and forever. That means completely. The King James says to the uttermost. He is able once and forever to save those who come to God through him. And he lives forever to intercede with God on their behalf. Meaning he is able to save to the uttermost. To the uttermost. He is able to save us to the very end. And right now, he is interceding for us. Now imagine that. If you knew that Jesus Christ was down the hallway outside those doors in the next room praying for you 
What would that do for you when you stood up and sang these songs? Come on now. If I knew that Jesus Christ was down there in the next room on his knees as I'm preaching, saying, Father, bless Brian and help him to proclaim my word boldly and with clarity. Do you think that would have an effect on my preaching? I'm telling you it would have an effect on my preaching. Well, let me tell you something. Jesus is praying for me and he's praying for you too. For the Bible says he lives to make intercession for us. Amen? Amen. Is he on the cross, my friend? His work was finished. But at the throne... His work continues. He goes on to make intercession for us. And just as Jesus prayed for Simon Peter, he's praying for you and he's praying for me today. And he is still in control in spite of any failure. And his love will never dim. And all God's people said, amen. Bow your heads in prayer, folks. Bow your heads. Father, we thank you so much for the love of your son Jesus Christ. A love that has caused him to be so enwrapped in our lives, so in love with us that that he literally lives uh, to serve us, lives to love us, lives to advance us and to protect us and to watch over us and to care for us. And He'd do anything it takes to make us successful. Thank you, Lord, for the love of your son Jesus. A love that drove him to sacrifice himself to protect us and to give us an abundant life. We love you today. We love you today and we honor you today. In Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen.